the news I have to share with you tonight is not good, um, except when I get to the end and talk about what we can do to help fix or at least mitigate the problem. So CWD will ruin more than just your day, could ruin your future hunting opportunities, potentially. Um, so, and I say CWD with the assumption that everyone understands that stands for chronic wasting disease. And we'll talk more about exactly what that is and how it works. So why you should care about CWD, I'm guessing that everyone on this call cares about at least one of these three species, if not all of them. Um, additionally, if you have any interest in antlers like I do, that should matter to you. Um, if you like to eat venison, and when I say venison, I mean not just white-tailed deer, um, but any member of the deer family. And I'll touch on who all belongs to that. But even in the bigger picture, if you like having a state wildlife agency to manage all of the wildlife populations in your state, then this talk is for you. Um, because CWD is draining the, what's, I don't even know a good alternative word for manpower. I need to get that into my vocabulary, a more inclusive word. Um, it's draining a lot of the financial and personnel resources from states across the United States, um, state wildlife agencies across the US, and it's only going to get worse unless we take some serious actions toward mitigation. So to, to kind of take a little bit of a different spin on this, we were all very familiar with COVID-19, unfortunately, by this point in our lives. So if COVID-19 were CWD, which it's not, obviously, um, but just thinking outside the box here, everyone that got it would be dead after being infected for more than a year. There's no vaccine or treatment. Um, you could get it from a surface years after an infected person um, deposited body fluids there, including saliva, urine, blood. This would even apply to soil. Um, babies could be born with it. There would be no way to confirm that you had it until after you had already died from it. And your dead body could infect anyone that came into close contact with it even after you completely decomposed. So it's rough stuff. Obviously, this is not the situation with COVID-19, but in thinking about it this way, we can, I think, grasp the magnitude of the problem um, because it's been around for about the 1960s. So for some people, I think it's kind of become old news. And that's why I'm trying to, for lack of a better term, pump, pump up the fear factor just a little bit because this is something that really needs to be taken seriously. And I hear, I've listened to a, a number of scientific talks or presentations on chronic wasting disease. And invariably they start with this line that's like, um, you know, it's a always fatal degenerative neurological disease. And I feel like they just kind of skip over it at this point. Like everybody just kind of takes it in and yep, 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 nods to the next thing. But I really want to pause here and delineate that CWD is always lethal. Every animal that contracts it will die from it. I have brain eating disease up here. Really what it is, is um, a disease that ends up creating large holes in the brain. So it gives it the appearance of a sponge, um, which is where the it's classified as a TSE, a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. So that's where the spongiform comes from. Um, and basically the way that this happens, well, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, it's not been shown to impact human health, but there is a little bit of conflicting research out there. So to date, there's no known cases um, of human uh, CWD. There are other similar diseases that do affect humans, um, but there's never been a case of CWD in people to date. Um, but certainly it reduces the vitality the age structure, and the overall numbers of deer populations. Um, and this has happened in more than one state and has been demonstrated by more than one scientific study. So these are photos of animals in captivity that have CWD in the very late clinical stages where they're showing symptoms. Um, these animals probably expired not long after these photos were taken. 
So tonight we're going to talk about how CWD works and what we need to do about it as responsible conservationists and sportswomen. So TSEs, as I said before, transmiss transmissible spongiform encephalopathies are unique. Um, they're caused by misfolded prions. So a prion protein is something that's normally found in a lot of mammals, um, including humans, and they're just part of our normal functioning. But a CWD prion, which I'll just refer to as prion for the rest of this talk, is basically a protein that has misfolded and goes around causing other proteins to also misfold. And once they're misfolded, they accumulate in the brain and that's what ends up cre creating these large lesions and the, the sponge-like appearance. Um, so because a prion is just a protein, it's not alive. It's not like a bacteria or a virus, you can't kill it. Um, it's already kind of inert, so to speak. Um, yeah, and then here's just a, a stained slide of a cross-section of a brain. Um, on the left, you can see is a CWD negative. And then on the right, you can see is a CWD positive. You can see all the lesions. And um, I, I believe that the staining is indicating hemorrhaging also around the lesions, but it does not look healthy because it's not. So we don't actually know how CWD began. Um, the current line of thinking is that, well, the first known case was reported in Northwestern Colorado in 1967 in a captive mule deer. Um, and this was in a research facility where mule deer were held in close conjunction with sheep. Um, and so their sheep have their own TSE called Scrapey. Anybody involved in agriculture probably knows about this. It works kind of the same way that CWD does. Um, so the thought is that maybe those animals being in close contact somehow caused CWD to be created. Um, but we don't know that that's where it came from because eventually people realized that probably it had been in the wild population there since the early 60s. Um, so we don't know exactly when it started, but around, we can say that decade probably. Um, and there may have been, it could have started spontaneously with wild mule deer coming into close contact with domestic sheep infected with scrapie um, and could have happened multiple times. Uh, we don't really know. But since that time, since its discovery, it has spread, I think now it's in 26 states um, and a number of different countries. And I'll show you a map that breaks that down in more detail later. But basically it's spread through normal movements of wild infected animals, um, but also through human assistance in some cases. And so that's what we can zero in on to try to mitigate both of these. But the human assistance is one that you can do, you can take action um, towards in your own backyard, in your own hunting journey. So this is a distribution of CWD in 2005 within the US. So you can see that the gray is where it was in free ranging populations of deer. And you can see it's concentrated in large part around um, the area in Colorado where it was first described and identified. Um, it was also in Wisconsin at this time. So, and in parts of Canada in free ranging populations. So it seems unlikely that a deer walked itself from Colorado to Wisconsin and didn't cause any other um, infection foci along the way, right? This is probably a result of um, either live animals being transported with CWD or potentially um, CWD infected parts from harvested animals being moved um, or even potentially uh, body fluids from infected deer, so things like urine um, or semen for, you know, captive breeding facilities. Um, we don't know, but maybe Lindsay can speak more to that um, whenever I'm done talking. <laughs> but then you can see that uh, the yellow dots represent CWD where it was present in captive facilities, 
um, in red, and those are ones that had been depopulated. So they were found to be positive and all the animals in that facility were euthanized. And then the red dots are, at that, at that time in 2005, um, CWD positive facilities that had not yet been depopulated. So it's kind of three big areas. And this is it today. So 2005 to 2021, it's not been a long time to see this much spread. Um, so this is this is a big, big problem. And it's also in Finland, Norway, Sweden, and in wild populations of deer. And in South Korea, it's in uh, captive populations of elk or maybe red deer. Um, yeah, so you can take a look at this again after, or you can just go to USGS website, it's up there. Um, but this really illustrates, I think, the scope of the problem. So the way that it is spread primarily, we think, in the wild is through body fluid. So urine, feces, saliva, um, that also includes blood. And it primarily spreads through direct and indirect oral transmission. So we can think about congregate congregation sites where a lot of deer are coming into contact with other deer, either directly because they're in direct competition over food, so nose to nose, um, or one deer is there licking on a mineral lick, and then, you know, the next day or a week, or as it turns out, years later, another deer comes along and they can contract um, the, those prions and become infected. And unfortunately, when CWD prions um, are shed onto the ground, they can bind with soil particles, um, clay particles in particular, and actually become more infectious than before. Um, and this is, you know, it's been detected in soil at Mineral Licks in Wisconsin. So for a while, this was something that was just kind of bandied about, um, you know, to mitigate CWD, we need to reduce uh, congregation of animals, which it's true and intuitive relate, relative to all disease, right? Um, the less that organisms come together, the less spread there's going to be. Um, but it's not hypothetical anymore or theoretical. It's been shown to be located at sites like this. So experimentally, uh, there has been transmission from a doe to her fetus in utero. Um, that was in muntjac deer, which are not native to North America. Um, but prions have also, CWD prions have been detected in the fetal tissue of wild elk and white-tailed deer. So, and in addition to that, clinically normal five to six month old fawn, so a button buck, has have tested positive for CWD. So that means that deer are being infected, can be infected from their mothers even before they're born. And experimentally, they've even been able to get deer to contract it um, by breathing, breathing in prions. So aerosol transmission is not likely to be the main way that it's transmitted in the wild, um, but kind of interesting, they've been able to do this in, uh, in captive situation. So let's talk about the timeline of infection. If a deer and all members of the deer family. So in North America, that means caribou, elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, I guess black-tailed deer, um, any one of those animals and moose um, can contract CWD. So they contract it through coming into contact with the prions in the environment or with the infected individual. The prions begin doing their thing, misfolding, and um, the animal starts shedding those prions in its urine and saliva and feces. And this we call the incubation period. So the time between when the animal is infected and when they start to look sick. Um, that lasts about 16 to 18 months, generally. Um, so that's quick math, that's about a year and a half. And for some genotypes that are a little bit more resistant, it can, this can let be like a five year long thing. So that animal is out there on the landscape, 
shedding prions, and it looks healthy. Um, and so this is something important to note when you go out hunting and you harvest an animal and it looks healthy, um, most, I would say the, the vast majority of CWD positive deer that are harvested look completely normal. So keep that in mind. So after that waiting period of generally about a year and a half, um, symptoms begin. So the clinical signs of CWD are extreme weight loss, a really wide stance and um, kind of staggery movement, droopy ears, lowered head, excessive salivation. This makes sense because that's how the disease um, spreads itself is through body fluid. So by causing animals to salivate a lot and be very thirsty, they're not only going to be shedding a lot of prions, but they're going to be congregating around um, drinking sites. Um, and so after, from this point, when symptoms begin, um, it can take a few days or as long as a year for the animal to die. Um, and generally they die of aspiration pneumonia, actually, um, not from their brain having a bunch of holes in it which I thought was kind of crazy. Um, but because of the extra saliva and, you know, their lethargic state, it's, it would be normal for them to aspirate things um, at a higher rate than a healthy animal. So another reason for um, any animal that is shown to die of pneumonia to have their brain tested, right? Because you wouldn't know unless you tested them. So now an uh, important thing to remember is that the prions are now in the environment. Wherever that animal was and wherever its body parts go, so this um, harkens back to if you go hunting somewhere and bring your harvest home, um, if it is infected with CWD, we need to be cognizant of how we dispose of those body parts um, because wherever they go, the prions go um, in, in different degrees depending on the body part. Um, and the stage of the disease, but they can remain infectious in the environment for several years, um, maybe up to a decade, maybe longer. We don't really know. So getting into testing, um, by the end of this talk, it will be very clear that I'm a big proponent of having, your, having every deer you harvest um, tested for CWD. But I wanna talk about, a little bit about how the testing works in Again, maybe Lindsay can um, explain this further because I am certainly not an expert when it comes to testing for diseases. Um, so one thing to note is that the prions are detectable a long time before those clinical signs develop. So like I said, you can harvest an animal that looks healthy and you can still get a positive CWD result um, because the prions are already circulating in the body and accumulating in different parts of the body. Um, they accumulate in the highest numbers and most quickly in the in the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which I believe we have them, would be located right under your jaw. Um, and then followed by that is the obex, which is the base of the brain stem. So they're at the highest concentrations in neurological tissue, um, but they occur throughout the body. Um, currently, there is only a valid, accepted, approved test for dead animals. So um, post-mortem tests, the animal has to be dead, cut out the lymph nodes or the obex, um, and you can see if there's prions in the animal. The readout of the test is either positive or not detected, um, and that's because there's no way to say with 100% certainty that an animal does not contain CWD prions. Um, only that they were at levels too low to be detected, which generally means they don't have CWD, um, but you can't get a negative test result. Uh, a live test is an active area of research. I think it's intuitive to understand the utility of having a live test. Um, this would go a long way in reducing sick animals, well, infected animals from being moved. Um, just because they look healthy and we don't know that they're CWD positive. So um, there's been a test developed involving an ear punch. And this is an image from that research paper kind of showing all the different places that they tested on the ear. Um, so basically they were able to 
extract prions from these tissues and thus say the animal was positive or it was not detected. This is not nearly as um, clear cut of a test, I guess, and it's not as precise and specific as the postmortem test. So hopefully in the future it will be, but right now it's not a test that can be relied on definitively to say one way or the other if an animal is positive. So CWD has a lot of negative impacts. Um, specifically, when we think about impacts to populations, we need to think about how, how it's spread. So deer themselves move, obviously they have legs. Um, some of them migrate, some of them don't move that far, but move regularly um, and some more than others. So males um, often have much higher rates of CWD within the same population. Adult males, mature males will have um, a higher prevalence of CWD because, and this is in white-tailed deer, because of um, basically their life history. So during the rut, males are moving around, they're coming into contact with more individuals than um, does and fawns who are still a part of their matrilineal family groups. Um, so just by association, they end up contracting CWD at a higher rate because they move more. Uh, and that's seasonal. That's why I have that bullet point up there because obviously that's, they don't move like that all year round. Um, and then in other species, uh, you know, some populations of mule deer are migratory, some populations of elk are migratory, so they can be traversing really long distances. Um, and then on their wintering grounds, coming into contact with a lot of, many more individuals than they typically would um, in other parts of the year. Also deer parts. Um, so I just did a quick Google search on white-tailed deer semen. First time I ever did that. Um, and this came up, high roller, isn't he a stud? <laughs> Literally, it looks a little grotesque to me, but um, his semen is worth $500 per dose. Um, I don't know how they quantify that, but this kind of stuff, the, the captive breeding industry regularly buys and sells individual animals um, or semen or urine for like scent lures. Um, you, you can still buy natural deer urine, which ironically, there's no um, scientific evidence, fun fact, that um, bucks are drawn to doe estrus urine. Like there's no research supporting that using that is gonna improve your chances of your hunt. So don't use it. Um, but there's things like that that get moved around and shipped around and could very easily contain CWD prions from animals that look completely healthy. I mean, high roller here could have had CWD for, you know, a year and a half and look just like he does because that's how the disease manifests. So in the long term, I'm going to look at some stats here. Um, again, looking to Wisconsin because and Lindsay, I would love to hear you two cents on this, but Wisconsin has struggled with CWD because um, in large part, after it was discovered, the state wildlife agency tried to mitigate the spread by reducing deer numbers and it was, they just did not have public support. Um, and so there's a lot of, I guess, battles. There's been a lot of ups and downs and back and forth with that, but essentially they, can't get hunters to harvest deer at the target rates in the CWD areas um, that they want. So the prevalence has expanded a lot. It's more than tripled in less than 20 years. And so if we extrapolate that, this is just my own quick math, um, in another, you know, 20 or so years, if it tripled again, you'd be almost at about 100% prevalence of CWD in adult male deer in that part of Wisconsin. And this is sobering because 2038, we're probably all still gonna be hunting in 2038. This isn't like some arbitrary, hard to imagine, um, far off date in the future. So this is relevant to future generations certainly, but to us here today. Um, and this isn't to say that all of those deer there are gonna have CWD, but the, the mature bucks, like I was talking about before, those that are especially susceptible could. And it's been shown that infected animals die at a faster rate than uninfected animals. So 
This doesn't mean that they all die from aspiration pneumonia. This means they cumulatively die at a higher rate. So they're hit by cars more, they're harvested by hunters more, um, predators take them down more, um, you know, you name it, being on a lower nutritional plane going into winter, um, all of those things kind of tangle up relative to CWD um, and cause those animals to die at a faster rate. So I said at the beginning of the talk, if you care about antlers, then you should care about CWD because if you think about the, the timeline of the disease, it's, you know, right at about a year and a half, sometimes longer, but for white-tailed deer, it's typically a year and a half, maybe two years. How many two-year-old deer have you seen that have very impressive antlers? Not many. <laughs> um, so in the future, you know, if, if deer are being born with CWD or infected soon after, they're not going to be living long enough to produce antlers, which is the least of my worries, but the entire age structure of a population will be altered and that's going to have cascading effects for everything about that population, including how they breed, how they associate with one another, how yeah, I could go down the list, but um, it's a big problem. So really long term, um, you know, potentially not just in areas that are really hard hit today, like parts of Colorado, Wisconsin and Wyoming, um, but even in other areas, there could be so few deer because of population declines that our grandkids might need to pull a tag to go harvest a white-tailed deer in Pennsylvania or Mississippi or Tennessee, which today is unthinkable, right? There's, I don't know what the bag limit is in Tennessee, maybe three deer. Um, and so that's everybody. Everybody that goes and pays for a license can pull that many deer off the landscape and that may not be the reality down the road. Um, so in some areas, in those three states that I listed, more than 40% of free-ranging cervids are infected with CWD. That is crazy. That is crazy. If you go out and you kill two animals, chances are good that one is CWD positive. Um, and as I said before, there's, there's, it's been demonstrated multiple times that population declines result from CWD. Um, and in Colorado, you can see mule deer populations dropped almost by 50% in 20 years. So it's bad. And aside from not having those animals on the landscape anymore, which is heartbreaking enough, uh, state agencies are largely funded by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses. And most hunting licenses are bought to hunt big game. So deer are really what drives state wildlife agencies financially. Um, and that doesn't mean all the money that deer generate goes to managing deer, it goes to managing a lot of things. Um, basically everything the wildlife agency does. So even if you don't care about deer, you still need to care about this because it, it impacts everything. Um, and I've, I've seen firsthand when I was in graduate school in Mississippi, um, how devastating CWD can be to a state wildlife agency, um, especially one that's already on a tight budget, which news alert, all of them are. <laughs> so basically when CWD was discovered in Mississippi, everyone in the agency, no matter what their job title was, a component or even a majority of their job duties were now related to CWD, whether it was testing roadkill deer or um, public outreach or setting up freezer drop-offs for people to cut off their deer heads and leave to be tested around the state. Um, and it, people get tired, right? Like people didn't get into this career field to just manage this one huge insidious disease that isn't being taken care of the way it should. I mean, maybe some people did, but most people didn't. And so this is a drain on all the resources that manage all wildlife populations in North America. All right, so what do we do? That's all the doom and gloom. Um, here is what needs to be done to slow the spread of CWD. We probably can't stop the spread and we cannot get rid of it where it already is. Um, so the task ahead of us is to do what we can to slow it down. The number one thing is to reduce the population density of deer. Um, this is true across the board, but especially true for white-tailed deer. Um, mule deer and elk 
this may not be as applicable. Um, there's a lot of parts of the country where white-tailed deer are just way overpopulated. Um, one fun fact is that there's currently more white-tailed deer in the United States than there was at the time of uh, European arrival here. Um, so we love deer and deer love the way we live on the landscapes. So there's a lot of them. Uh, so we need to have fewer of them just so they're coming into contact less and spreading prions less. We need to limit congregation sites. This means no baiting, no feeding, don't even have bird feeders that deer can get to. Um, it's really important to not bring animals together artificially um, at an artificially high rate, I guess, by having, you know, what amounts to ice cream cones scattered out across the landscape. We need to change some of the legislation around the captive deer industry. So right now, I should have put, I should have included this map. Um, but the National Deer Association has a, a nice map that outlines the whole country and in each state, captive deer facilities are either governed by the state wildlife agency, so the same people that manage deer in, this, in the wild deer in the state, or um, by the state's Department of Agriculture. So as you can imagine, those are two very different entities in each state with very different perspectives and goals related to animal management and disease management. Um, a lot of states are, captive facilities are governed by the Department of Agriculture, the State Department of Agriculture. Um, and this really leaves biologists hands tied as far as making rules and enforcing them. So this is something that you can affect change, I mean, maybe long term, um, but you can speak out about this and about changing this in your state if, if your state is not one where the wildlife agency is overseeing captive facilities. Um, and you can also just keep this in the back of your mind to understand that just because something is legal, just because something is allowable within the regulations, doesn't mean that it's a best practice, and it certainly doesn't mean that it's supported by the biologists and the experts in that state um, trying to manage this disease. So follow the laws, um, but hold yourself to a higher standard, and that's why I'm talking about this tonight. So hopefully if you didn't realize some of this before, now you have the knowledge um, to be able to apply that to the way that you hunt and the way that you behave on the landscape and the way that you talk to other people about how they do those things as well. Getting tested, get tested, <laughs> get all of your deer tested. Um, I can't say this enough from, you know, a personal health standpoint, even though there's, you know, there's no evidence out there that people can become infected with CWD to date. Um, it's still, the CDC still advises you to not consume an infected animal and I wouldn't personally consume an infected animal. Um, so get all of your deer tested. Even if you don't care yourself whether um, the animal has CWD or not, you are providing information to the state wildlife agency that's gonna help them hopefully better manage the population um, by knowing if your animal is positive or not. A lot of the states that discovered CWD, and I have this in air quotes because the discovery of CWD in a lot of states has actually happened long after the disease has been present there. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. Again, coming back to funding and capacity and a state's ability to test and be very vigilant um, looking for CWD, CWD in the landscape, it's expensive. So if they don't think CWD is there, it's probably not a big, I mean, today maybe it is, but 15 years ago, it wasn't a big priority. Um, for a lot of states. And so I lost where I was going with that. But getting tested, you can supply them with information that they may not otherwise have. Um, and actually, so I'll give the example of CWD was discovered in Mississippi in kind of like the southwestern central part of the state. So really close to the Mississippi River. And then Subsequently, testing ramped up. It was found in kind of the northeast part of the state, which is, you know, hundreds of miles separated. 
And then not too long after that, um, it was found in Tennessee where it wasn't known to be before that. And then after a little bit more testing, they realized that probably Mississippi was infected from Tennessee because Tennessee had this focal area where it had been accumulating for some time um, without being known about. So you're helping do your part in surveillance by getting tested. Um, and then talking about transporting deer parts. So if you go out of state to hunt, or if you hunt within your state, but you hunt within a CWD zone, or honestly, even if you are just going like 30 minutes away, you can do a large service um, to the wildlife population by deboning your carcasses um, and leaving whatever you're not gonna eat where you harvested that animal. And this logic comes from basically just the knowledge that when an animal does have CWD, prions accumulate and are in pretty much all of the tissues. So if you, you know, bring your deer home whole and then process it and you don't have any use for the spinal cord, you dump it out in the woods, you know, maybe on your back 40 or maybe in your backyard or whatever. If it was positive, you've just now spread prions to a place where they may not have been before. Um, so, and, and one person doing this is probably not a big deal, but um, this is a map of the home zip codes of everyone that harvested a deer in four counties in Wisconsin between 2016 and 2017. So if any few of those people <laughs> harvested CWD positive animals and took body parts back home with them that they well, whether they consume them or not, they've deposited them now um, where they live. So very quickly, this could become significant. And that's why um, a lot of state wildlife agencies now are, have transport regulations about where they'll ban whole carcasses from coming into the state, or you know they might ban whole carcasses from leaving a certain area of the state, or it's, it's unique to each um, state. But this is another area where you can just go above and beyond um, whether it's regulatory or not for you in your specific situation um, and kind of preemptively stop the spread. Because if you get your animal tested, you generally won't have a result for two or three weeks um, at the soonest. And so by that time, certainly you've already headed home with your meat, I would think. Um, and so you don't really, you do, it's hard to know beforehand. All right, so let's talk about some other potential vectors besides members of the deer family. So pigs are significant. They've been shown to be able to accumulate CWD prions by eating infected tissue, um, by eating tissue from a CWD positive deer, um, also from having it injected into their brain. Turns out it's pretty easy to give an animal CWD by injecting prions into their brain. <laughs> Go figure. Um, that doesn't happen in nature that I know of. Um, so that's a little bit less of a concern, but being able to eat infected tissue and um, then have prions accumulate is a little bit more significant, especially because of another wildlife issue, which is feral hogs. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware of um, feral hogs are expanding across the United States and they're super destructive for a lot of reasons, but if they're able to harbor CWD prions, um, and spread them, then that could be a huge potential problem and contribute to the spread of CWD. So interestingly enough, uh, researchers have found that prions that pass through the digestive system of predators and scavengers maintain infectivity afterwards. Um, so in their scat, in their feces, uh, those prions are still infective. However, um, that was done in captivity. And in the wild to date, there haven't been any, you know, coyotes, cougars, vultures, whatever, um, found to contain CWD prions in their bodies. So this may or may not be, this is probably a less significant source of CWD transmission than transporting carcasses. I'll say that. People transporting car carcasses. Okay, so there is a study that began some time ago um, and is still going on where basically researchers 
use macaque monkeys as human proxies to determine if they could contract CWD. And this is a very confusing area of research because there have been, some of the monkeys are still alive as far as I'm aware. So the final results have not been published of a study. However, um, that final bullet point there, you can see one study was published from these data showing a complete lack of transmission to macaques. So there's five monkeys that um, died or became so ill that they were euthanized, they were wasting, um, and some other things. And this study that was published, I'll link to it at the end of the presentation, you can go read it yourself if you're interested, basically found that some of the monkeys had diabetes and just some other issues that they determined were the cause of them being so sick. And these monkeys were either fed infected tissue or um, injected intracerebrally with prions. So that study maintains that there's no transmission. The monkeys did not have CWD. Other researchers have um, presented some of their findings. It's not been peer reviewed. It's not been published yet um, because some of the monkeys are still alive. Um, they've presented research saying that those same monkeys did indeed have CWD um, prions in them. Uh, and this stuff is over my head to be completely honest. But my understanding is what it comes down to is a, a differences in testing, like a different method of amplifying the prions after the tissue has been blended up in an assay has been created. So that, in my understanding, is where the discrepancy lies. Um, some of the researchers using the method they use found prions, others did not. Um, this study is very significant because it will never be replicated. Um, there will never be another ethics board that allows a bunch of cute little monkeys like those to be inoculated with prions over and, and monitored for 20 years. Or maybe if there was an ethics board that would adhere to that, the, the funding for a study like that is going to be nearly impossible to come by. So this is kind of our our one case study, so to speak, that we're looking at to kind of give us the word on, is it really likely that people are going to get it or not? Now, having said that, people all over the country have been consuming CWD infected venison for decades. Um, this is just the fact of the matter. If you can harvest an animal that looks healthy and is CWD positive and don't get it tested, people are eating it. Um, and to date, there's no known case of human illness linked with CWD exposure. So take from that what you will. I got a few questions from ambassadors. Thank you um, for submitting them. So I'm just going to walk through these and then I'll be pretty much done and we can open up for discussion. Um, so this question was about transport laws. Um, say, seem to say that only deboned meat can be transported but I've been told that entire quarters are okay. Am I misunderstanding the term deboned meat? This is an excellent question. Um, and no, you are not misunderstanding the term deboned meat. Um, but I have an example quote here from, this is Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, this is their little write-up about transportation restrictions. And this is going to vary from state to state. But you can see here that it says, while hunters can't bring whole carcasses back, they can bring back the following quarters or other portions of meat with no part of the spine or head attached. And I think that's really what a lot of these transport regulations are getting at. They don't want the spinal column or brain to be moved because that is the tissue that holds those prions um, in such large quantities. And because it's, it's easy to discard the spinal column, right? Like there's nobody's, nobody I know eats the spinal column. Um, so read your regulations for your own state because um, it's going to vary. But I think, yes, a quarter has a bone in it, but the, the you know, it's probably no more significant than what's in the meat around, surrounding that bone. So is it dangerous in terms of potentially spreading CWD to do things like make earrings, buttons, tools, um, et cetera, out of bone or antler? 
Well, knowing what we know, prions do accumulate in bone and antler in um, CWD positive animals, but I would say that especially if you get your deer tested and get a not detected result, the you're good. Um, and even in an animal that's positive, this is going to be negligible compared to transporting the spinal column and brain tissue and things like that. Oh. Okay, so if a deer has been found negative for CWD, which it wouldn't be, right? It would be found not detected. Um, is there any reason to be concerned about getting CWD from bone broth or bone marrow? So again, if your deer is found not detected, I would eat it. Um, but, and there's no evidence that it's transmissible to humans, but the CDC does recommend that people do not consume CWD infected animals. And so this would apply to bone broth and bone marrow as well. If you did get a, a positive result, um, that would apply to all tissues of that animal. And this is an excerpt from the CDC's website, which I'll link to as well. Um, it just says that the studies done on CWD raise concerns that there may also be a risk to people. And that's hearkening back to most likely the macaque study that um, is still going on. Okay, <laughs> has the study on CWD transmission to primates been published yet? So this is the study that I've been talking about, um, sort of. So like I talked about before, some of the monkeys are still alive and some of what's been published contradicts what's been presented at conferences. Um, so I am sorry for that. The scientific method is hard at work here um, and we are eagerly awaiting the peer reviewed results. Um, and I included a hyperlink. You're probably, you can't click that link. That was stupid. I'll put it in the chat after this um, to that published paper. So if you want to read it and see what you can glean from it, you're welcome to do that. Okay, so now on the practical side of things, caring for your harvest and yourself um, as you're trying to feed yourself. So when you're processing a deer, wear gloves. Um, this is something that I kind of take for granted now as an adult, but when I was a kid hunting with my dad and uncles, I wanted to be tough and cool and they didn't wear gloves. And so, you know, I just got in there with my hands and don't do that, please wear gloves. <laughs> There's other diseases that you can contract from wildlife. Um, when you're field dressing it and processing it. So the CDC actually also recommends that you wear eye protection um, when processing um, deer that could be infected with CWD. Um, and recently, some researchers found that you can kill prion. Well, you can't kill them, they're not alive, but you can cause them to not be infectious anymore um, by soaking your knives and processing utensils in a bleach for five minutes in a bleach solution. So this will not work if there's any tissue on there because bleach is just a surface disinfectant. So if there's like chunks of meat, you wanna clean that off before you um, disinfect your knives because um, they will not be successfully dis um, decontaminated. So prions are, CWD prions, you can't really denature them with heat except at very, very high temperatures, like nothing your oven could ever replicate. Um, so you can't really burn them up. Um, you, you, can't, you can't kill them or cause them to be inert, um, but this is a way that after you process your deer, it's pretty easy to put everything you use in a five minute bleach soak. And that's just another step in protecting yourself and you know the rest of your food, I guess, from what your deer may or may not contain that you probably don't know at the time that you're processing it, right? If you're waiting a few weeks to get your test result. So if you live in a state, a lot of states now are providing routes for you to submit your deer to be tested for CWD. Um, some are not, specifically states where it hasn't been discovered. Um, those are the only ones that I know of. Some of them that aren't um, offering this service but you can sample the deer yourself. Um, so there's a great video on Montana's state wildlife website there um, that walks through how to extract those lymph nodes. And it's actually pretty easy. Um, you just kind of tilt the deer's head back, 
get a sharp knife and cut straight, straight down into its throat and you'll expose those lymph nodes and then you can just drop them into some alcohol. And then as far as getting them sent off to be tested, contact your wildlife agency. That's gonna look different in every state. Um, but if you're in, in the rare case where your wildlife agency doesn't have an avenue for you to submit a sample for testing, um, Lindsay, maybe you can tell us what to do then because I don't know. I'm sure there's a way you can do it yourself, but it may be complicated. Okay, so these are some resources that if you're at all interested, I would highly recommend. The CWD Alliance at First Bullet is just kind of a repository of a lot of information about CWD. Um, AFWA, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which is like a, a all the state wildlife agencies kind of, this is their go-to gold standard. They've published uh, best management practices for wildlife agencies to follow in regards to CWD. Um, you can take a look at that and advocate for the things that are in there, whether they're happening in your state or not. Um, you can arm yourself with knowledge and then try to go to bat for the wildlife agency. Um, a lot of like I said before, a lot of the biologists and the people on the ground in the agency may su support things that aren't necessarily being implemented. Um, so you can, you can lend your voice to that. Recommendations for hunters. So that's the CDC talking about their guidelines around harvesting animals that might be infected with CWD and, and what to do to be safe. Um, the, that map that I showed you by the USGS showing kind of the progression of CWD um, over the years and where it currently is. So that the map that I showed you is almost literally today. It's from October of 2021. So it's very current. You can go there if you wanna see if CWD is near you. Um, the published results from the macaque study there, I have the link there. I realized my mistake. <laughs> um, so you can go there and read that. The National Deer Association has some great resources on CWD. They obviously are heavily invested in the success of deer populations, and so they are a great resource um, on the topic of CWD. 